Welcome to an Alp Book Club, where we dive into books we love and share what they're about and our learnings with you. Welcome to our book club on The Ascent of Money by Niall Ferguson. I'm a finance and history geek, and that's what led me to this book. But before diving into the book itself, I want to start out with a story. On November 16th, 1532, Francisco Pizarro, a Spanish conquistador and explorer, sprang a trap that paved the way for his receiving, quite literally, a king's ransom in gold. An entire room of gold and silver bars. Pizarro had sailed south from Panama into what is today Peru, where he encountered the Incan Empire. After years of civil war, Atahualpa, the Incan emperor, was in the process of consolidating his rule and upon receiving an offer from Pizarro to join him in a feast in his honor, he agreed. There was no reason for him to suspect a trap. He had 80,000 men in the mountains surrounding Cayamarca and brought 5,000 men with him to the feast. Besides, the envoy who had arrived to extend the invitation was no less than Pizarro's brother. The two things he didn't account for, though, would prove to be crucial in his miscalculation, which would bring down the Incan Empire. Spanish ruthlessness and guns. Pizarro sprung his trap, and despite being outnumbered 20 to 1, he managed to massacre Atahualpa's entire entourage and take the emperor himself captive. Pizarro kept Atahualpa alive in return for the ransom he offered, a room full of gold and silver. And you can probably guess what happened next. After receiving the ransom, Pizarro decreed Atahualpa be put to death on the charge of inciting rebellion. Originally, he was supposed to be burned at the stake, but after being converted, he was simply hung. It's a brutal, crazy story that happened all across Central and South America during the European conquests. And our story of the ascent of money starts with the literal, literal boatload of gold that Pizarro shipped back to Spain. And you would think that that much gold entering Spain would make everyone richer, right? It's new gold entered the, the economy, but that's actually not really what happened. It's true that the influx of gold from the new conquests in Central and South America led to Spain becoming a European superpower, but only up to a point, because what it really led to was inflation. The influx of gold, of money, into Spanish and European economies just led to a rise in prices. Because the Spanish economy wasn't growing, per se, there weren't any large breakthroughs in productivity or anything like that. You could still only buy the same things, the same services. Only now, there was much more money, more gold, chasing them, which led to inflation. In economic terms, Pizarro's boatload of gold increased the monetary supply without increasing the supply of goods. Money's tricky, and its ascent to dominate the world is what fascinated me about this book. So let's dive in to the main question of this book, The Ascent of Money. And that, to my mind, is, is money parasitical? Is the finance industry just a bloodsucker, or do they contribute to society? What's the role, or really the history, of money and financialization in our society? And that's the key question that this book sets out to explore. And as a finance and history geek, well, it really spoke to me. Because financialization is everywhere. From buy now, pay later, to mortgages and insurance, really everything these days has been quote unquote financialized. And that's the story of human history, a procession towards this. Is that good or bad? The main premise of the book is that no, money is not parasitical and that the ascent of money through society is a core driving power of progress. Credit and debt have been the building blocks of industry, research, capitalism, and Western society as a whole. They help facilitate the movement of money, of capital, from the place it is to the place it needs to go, the efficient allocation of capital. And that's the story of the book. It's the procession of the financial instruments that have been developed, invented, theorized, and trialed over the past centuries that have caused this change, and it's a dramatic and powerful one, powerful enough to conquer the world, which is exactly the story of European expansion during the Renaissance 
and the last five centuries. It's no coincidence that the countries who figure out how to facilitate financialization conquered. First it was the Spanish, with massive gold imports from Central and South America, and then it was the British and Dutch who reinvented banking, understood risk management, and how to spread that risk across the population, which led to much better resource allocation than anyone else in the world, not to mention aligning incentives of everyone involved, the army, the merchant class, the government, financiers, everyone. They discovered a superpower. But financialization can be a double-edged sword that puts money on a pedestal above values. It isn't always good. Finance and financialization became a golden calf leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. Financialization of assets, in this case, mortgage-backed securities, led to a huge disconnect between the real-world assets and those who purchased them. Basically, a huge misalignment of interests. And we'll get into all of these periods of history more down the line as we dive deeper into the book. But another bad outcome from financialization, less well-known, less dramatic, but just as impactful, is the unintended consequences that occur. Like how the last 70 years of globalization have seen the dollar lose 87% of its value. Which sounds crazy! That since 1957, the dollar has literally become 87% less valuable, and that has really impacted the middle class for the last 20 years. These are dramatic outcomes that occur from financialization, and because they're obfuscated, hidden away, or they happen slowly, they occur without most of us noticing. This is the story about the rise of financialization, securitization, and risk management, which are all in some form or another coordination systems for society. They help coordinate us. That's the key learning. Finance is all about coordination and human interaction, as much as it is about numbers. And better human coordination has the power to alleviate much human suffering. In many ways, a poor society is a function of bad financial freedom, which lets those with capital prey on those without. Told you that I'd be geeking out about this, so let's dive into the book. We've been fascinated with gold basically forever. And there's something about it, its density that makes it heavier than you'd expect, that gives it more substance, maybe its shininess and color that we enjoy, and its malleability, which is what allows us to shape it into jewelry. But none of those factors is what made gold the financial asset, and often a form of money that it is and has been throughout history. It's something else. And to get at that, we need to understand what money is. And that's a question I've wondered about more and more especially after becoming interested in macroeconomics and cryptocurrencies. What makes money, money? What makes a paper bill worth something, or a coin, or some numbers in a bank account? And the answer is so simple that it's kind of crazy. Money is, and has always been, a form of communication and coordination for who owns what and who owes what. Who owns and who owes. Money isn't dollars or even gold, it's information. And it's got to be trusted information to have value. It's no wonder we trust paper bills. We trust the government, and that's what gives value to the paper. Money isn't metal or paper, it's trust inscribed. And by the way, that sentence before about money's information made me jump immediately in my mind to Bitcoin, because that's exactly what gives Bitcoin value. If it's simply information about who owns and who owes, Why not do that digitally? But that's not discussed in the book at all. Belief is such a central part of what money is that the word credit comes from the Latin word credo, I believe. And gold was a great way to have faith. It had three properties that made it a great metal to convey monetary information. It's hard to forge gold. There's only a limited amount of it. It doesn't decay. Unlike bronze or other metals, it doesn't rust or tarnish so the information has a lot of staying value. Gold you have today will still be with you after a 100 years if you keep it safe. Last but not least is that it's malleable. You can divide gold fairly easily. It's a soft metal. Take those three together and you get a good metal that can convey who owns and who owes. The crazy thing about this book is that it made me realize that really for decades, From the Romans through the Middle Ages, 
financialization stagnated in the West. Nothing happened. Nothing was discovered or improved. Gold continued to serve as money. Coins and commodities also served. The spice trade flourished. But nothing more. Why? Well, religion. Judeo-Christian religions prohibit lending and interest, which are key parts of any financial system. And there's a reason for that, that lending and usury were prohibited in the Bible. Because until financial innovation and the freedom that ensued, the only lending that occurred was usurious. Those with money lent at exorbitant rates, which led to slavery and a huge bifurcation in the population. There just wasn't enough understanding of the risk involved, the math and statistics, and no way to generate a free market around lending. Indeed, it was in fact importing ideas from the East to Pisa in Northern Italy and to one famous mathematician named Leonardo Fibonacci in the beginning of the 13th century that set things off. Pisa had several different circulating currencies, seven actually, and they really needed exchanges and everything that finance has to offer to make those things work. And in his book, Liber Abaci, the book of calculation, Fibonacci started to popularize in the West ideas that had been known in the East for quite a number of years, mainly the Hindu counting system, which was decimal and made calculating interest much simpler, fractions, and importantly, how to calculate present value, which is really like the key term in finance. And it's hard to overstate how important these ideas are to everything in finance. And as the book unfolds, the real hero, which I love, love, is math and statistics. They lead to banking and financial innovation, which in turn lead to financial freedom and prosperity. And the first bank is what we'll get into next. The beginning of the flowering of financial institutions occurred right next to Fibonacci's Pisa, in Renaissance-era Italy with the Medici family in Florence. The Medicis rose to greatness through their European banking empire. The term bankers actually comes from the Italian word banco, which means bench. They literally sat on benches in the town square and plied their trade. But if lending to fellow Christians was not allowed, what exactly were they banking? And to understand that, we have to understand the times. The early Renaissance is a decentralized time, a period of many city-states and no powerful central authority. Even the Vatican is not a supreme leader. This means that there are many currencies and many rulers, and all of those currencies trade freely based on the relative strength and stability of their local nation. This means there was a need for money changers, and that's exactly what the Medici family did. They were currency traders, lending currency in one place and receiving it in another, in return for a small fee, of course. And this wasn't lending, and so it was allowed by the church. Now, what led to the Medici's success was sound management and diversification. Sound management and book management in the form of double-entry bookkeeping. Yet another practice imported from the East and written about by Luca Pacioli, another Italian mathematician, but made popular by the Medici's. The second key part of their success was in diversification, much needed when trading currencies across the continent. Giovanni di Bici de Medici made sure to spread his bank branches out across Europe. The success of the Medici bank gave rise to one of the first complete marriages between banks and governments in the form of Lorenzo di Medici, Giovanni's great-grandson, who became a de facto ruler of Italy. Even popes asked his advice on politics and war. And the Medici family went on to produce no less than four popes and two queens of France. Banking led to the beginning of credit formation, trading across regions, and economic coordination. There is a reason the Merchant of Venice was set in this period, and it revolves so much around banking, credit, and trade. They're interwoven. By the way, it's also set around how only the Jewish merchant can provide lending at an interest that will finance cross-Atlantic trade. But currency trading and double-entry bookkeeping was only the beginning of money's ascent. Over the next few centuries, banking shifts into the modern format we know today, with central banks, bills, and fractional reserve banks, and it shifts from Italy 
to Northern Europe, where those innovations happen. And that's what I'll be diving into in our next episode of The Ascent of Money by Niall Ferguson.